Uh, I'm here today to talk to you about uh, container file system interfaces. Um, I wasn't entirely sure what the level of the audience is, so I have some generic stuff about virtualization and everything. Uh, we appear to have plenty of time, so I can take questions as we're going. Um, I suppose I'm supposed to finish at lunchtime, which is 12.30, which would give me an hour and five minutes, but I won't bore you for that long. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I did spend a long time as a container evangelist at a company called Parallels, who wrote the original container system for Linux a long, long time ago called Virtuoso. Uh, the problem with it was, when it was produced in about 2001, is that most of the pieces never went upstream. So although it was based on Linux, it was unusable in upstream Linux without applying a load of patches. Um, one of my first challenges as uh, converting businesses to open source actually came from Parallels. They hired me in 2011 to, con to basically get all the container stuff upstream, which most of it now is. Um, I have to confess that before 2011, I hadn't really heard of containers and I wasn't really interested in virtualization. So all that changed. Um, I have been an open source advocate for a long time. Um, I have been a kernel developer for quite a long time. Uh, SCSI subsystem is still the main thing I do, although Martin Peterson does everything day to day. Um, my job mostly used to be to get a beating once, about once every three months from Linus, but fortunately Jens Axpo, who is here, has taken over that role rather nicely, so I'd like to say thank you very much. Um, and I'm still technically listed as the PA Risk architecture maintainer, one of three. Um, I do still play with my PA Risk boxes, but I have to confess that since Christmas, I've turned them on about once, which means that I'm not a very diligent architecture maintainer. So, onto the Linux Containers API, which is actually quite an interesting thing. Um, Traditional virtualization, as you probably know, is all about emulating hardware. So how many people here think they actually understand virtualization? <laughs> oh, come on. You're, what, three people? OK, right. So in standard Linux, oh, of course, oh, it's not too bad, actually. Um, this is what the kernels running on your laptops look like. You have a set of applications running on a kernel, running on a set of physical hardware. Everybody's laptop in the room presumably is running Linux. Um, if you're actually running Windows, I wouldn't tell anybody, but it's roughly the same thing as well. When you want to do virtualization, what you actually do is you take the hardware and you run effectively another operating system on top of it called a hypervisor. And this hypervisor has something called a virtual machine monitor, whose job is basically to emulate in software the hardware that is actually running underneath here. And this means that with this stack, a kernel can run on top of it. But the beauty of this stack is that you can run multiple kernels on top of the same hardware, and they can all think they own the same, uh, own, own uniquely the box. So this means that one physical system can run many virtual systems. This was the advantage of virtualization when effectively VMware came up with it in, uh, I think it was about 1999, the first time I saw it was VMware for, for desktop, so it was actually running on your laptops to help you run Linux, uh, Windows on Linux or Linux on Windows, of all things. Um, this has been the standard way we've done virtualization for almost the last nearly 20 years. So usually whenever anybody talks about a virtual data center, this is precisely what they mean. Um, the hypervisor operating system, I've put it there so as not to be controversial. To be honest, in the beginning, it was Linux. So when VMware first came up with it, their hypervisor operating system was Linux. It was actually Red Hat. And you could run Linux or Windows or anything else on top of it, Solaris as well in those days. Um, VMware since has moved on to claim their hypervisor operating system isn't Linux, which there's currently a lawsuit about in Germany. But if you look at most of our open source hypervisors, um, chances are the thing underneath is an operating system. For Linux, it would either be Xen or KVM. For Windows, it would be something like Hyper-V. Um, the concept of a thin hypervisor was something that VMware was running with for a while but doesn't really seem to be part of their modern mantra. So realistically, a hypervisor is an operating system. 
Um, the one most of you are probably familiar with is KVM. I, any Zen aficionados in the room before I rip it to shreds? <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, no. Uh, so I'm actually not going to rip either of the hypervisors to shreds, but what I will point out is that Zen and KVM are two completely separate subsystems within Linux. So effectively, Linux has the capacity to run two completely separate hypervisors. And the way they interact is actually fairly different as well. KVM is designed pretty much as a Linux on Linux hypervisor. Xen is designed as much more of a sort of Linux with, with pass-through hypervisor. Both of them actually make use of QMU to emulate most but not all of the devices. The main difference between Xen and KVM is how they emulate the non-QMU devices. So both of them use QMU to emulate devices they don't understand internally. Um, the reason for this and bringing it up is the fact that because we had two separate hypervisors and we had a big battle over them, and most of the battle, if you remember the early days, was over something called Paravert. Paravert means that you modify the actual kernel running on top, the guest kernel is modified, to allow it to talk directly to the hypervisor. And the reason Paravert was so important in the early days is because emulating hardware costs you a lot of machine cycles. So VMware, when it first produced uh, the virtual machine in 1999, did emulate everything. It was fully emulated in uh, software. You had no need at all to modify your kernel for anything paravert. The big problem was it was very slow. So the argument that Zen brought to the mixture was that if you actually did paravert modifications to the kernel, and in those days they actually, you actually required a separate kernel to boot up Zen. It wasn't trivial modifications. The uh, kernel that you're running in the guest can actually run a lot faster than if you have to emulate all of this hardware stuff. So the argument that Zen had was that paravirtualization would rule the world and that VMware full emulation would die. In reality, what happened is Zen pretty much died. The reason is that the hardware guys, the Intels and the AMDs of the world, did a lot of tweaking in hardware, the AMD Pacifica stuff, the Intel VT, VT stuff, to actually allow non-modified kernels to run at almost native speed on top of M, uh, the virtual machine monitor. So in hardware, they effectively got rid of most of the arguments that Zen had used for Paravert. Um, the only place that Paravert now really survives is in the drivers. Usually when you run a hypervisor as a guest, uh, sorry, when you run a guest kernel on top of a hypervisor, if you want fast storage or fast network, you have a, a paravirtual device driver that knows exactly how to communicate with the hypervisor operating system underneath it, just so you can do things like page sharing between the hypervisor and the kernel and all these other good things that allow the machine to go really fast. But anyway, the reason I brought up Zen and KVM is because the wasted effort that we did in Linux trying to support two fully separate virtualization systems effectively cost us the race to virtualization. It wasn't until 2005 that we started trying to unify them, and by that stage, VMware was fully entrenched in the um, enterprise market, and they have been very difficult to dislodge ever since. So the fact that we did a bifurcation of support for both Zen and KVM is probably the one reason why Linux didn't conquer the data center for virtualization. I mean, you can say it conquered in the fact that most of the virtual operating systems running in enterprise data centers in the cloud are Linux, but the virtualization substrate on which they run is now almost entirely VMware. So. This is a nice segue into containers, and container virtualization is basically about virtualizing the operating system itself. So there's none of this running stuff with two separate kernels. That's uh, one of the great advantages of containers. There's no separate kernel in this virtualization system. And the reason this makes containers a very good fit for things like the cloud is because in the uh, hypervisor system, where you have a lower operating system called a hypervisor and an upper operating system, it's actually very hard to manage resources. Because remember, the guest kernel is managing the resources as though it's the only thing that owns the machine. And if you have multiple guest kernels, they're all trying to behave like they're the only thing that own the machine. So if you think of Linux, the first thing Linux does whenever you boot it up on your laptop is it takes every bit of memory that's available to it and puts it into the uh, page cache. 
which is um, an unfortunate behavior for a hypervisor because you're trying to manage the memory very particularly. So hypervisors actually have to pull a lot of tricks to try and make sure that operating systems don't monopolize resources they think they have but are in reality shared with other things. And if you think about it, if you don't have a second kernel, you only have one kernel running the entire system for containers, none of these resource problems exist. This is why containers are ideally suited to be lean environments, because there is only a single kernel. That one kernel sees everything and how it's running on the entire system, even if that system is broken up into multiple containers, which you can think of as multiple virtual environments. Um, the price you pay for this is they don't, containers don't have a second kernel. This means that it's not possible to run Windows on Linux, say, in containers. Or actually, I have to qualify that statement because Microsoft actually just made it possible. Now, if you actually, you, you can actually bring up native Linux containers on Windows because they added what's effectively a whole Linux kernel emulation system to Windows itself. I haven't actually seen it running in the flesh, but I hear it works. It is theoretically possible to do almost the same thing on Linux. Um, and actually, one of the sets of containers that I run on my system, they're not Windows-based containers, but they're called architecture emulation containers. So I can actually make my x86 laptop think it's running a PowerPC64 by using a clever emulation system that is rooted in containers. So this trick of actually being unable to run operating systems that aren't supported by your kernel is actually uh, um, it, it's not entirely true, but you pay a significant cost for it. In Windows, the cost they pay is having to emulate all, this win, uh, all the Linux system calls through the Windows system. In my system, the cost I pay for it is actually having to emulate all the CPU instructions, so it is slow. Containers run best when the guest operating system that you're running is supported properly by the kernel. That effectively means that on Linux, you're running Linux containers, and on Windows, you're running Windows containers. So this is the interface that we have for containers in Linux. We have things called C groups. Um, they are thought of as the standard container interface, but in reality, C groups themselves find a lot of utility outside of containers. So although we use them extensively within containers, they're not exclusively a container subsystem. Their job is basically to manage resources. So what they do is they take a group of processes and restrict the amount of CPU time it can have. Or they take a group of processes and restrict the amount of I.O. that can go through or the amount of memory that can be attached. And this uh, resource management aspect of them is fully usable outside any container paradigm whatsoever. C groups are actually very easy to use. You just take any process you want, move it into the C group, and it will apply the constraints that you've given to it all entirely outside of any container orchestration system. Namespaces, on the other hand, are much more container-like. Um, there are really uh, sort of two essential sets of namespaces. There's effectively mapping namespaces, which are a label you apply to something. And once that label is applied, that thing is either in that namespace or it's not. So if you're in that namespace, you see it. And if you're not in that namespace, you don't see it. This is a label-based namespace. Um, the traditional and the world first label-based namespace was the net namespace. So if you've ever played around with the network namespace, and again, you can play around with it without having any form of containers other than the IP tool set, you can actually take an existing interface, place it into a network namespace, and it will just disappear from your host and reappear in that network namespace. It's exclusively owned by that namespace, and you can only see it if you enter that namespace. Other namespaces we have are actually more like uh, mapping namespaces. They're used to map resources from the parent into the namespace itself. So they usually take a view of resources that can be seen in the root namespace, and they map either a subset or the complete set into a namespace in a way that is uh, done differently. Uh, the archetypal mapping namespace is something called the PID namespace. Um, what it does is it takes a process ID in the parent and projects it into the namespace with a different PID. Uh, the essential reason for this is that if you want to run something called a system container, which has init inside it, init gets very annoyed if it's not PID1, so you need a PID namespace to pretend this thing that you started in the host is actually PID1 in the guest. <laughs> 
Any Linux orchestration system, this is the bit I'm proudest of, uses these two systems. Whatever it is, so LXC uses it, Docker uses it, the Mesos orchestration system uses it, uh, Parallels OpenVZ uses it. So the great thing about containers is that, although you've heard a lot of Kool-Aid about Docker containers or LXC containers or system containers or all sorts of other different types of containers, in Linux, they all use the same subsystem. There's none of this Zen versus KVM stuff. There's no separate subsystem that Docker uses that LXC doesn't use. They all use C groups and they all use namespaces. They use them in slightly different ways, but they use one standard kernel API. We were very proud of this when we actually it came about because at the kernel summit where this was discussed in Prague in 2011, there was a proposal that each of these subsystems would use a separate interface. And it was a reasonable fight to actually force everybody to use the same interface. Um, but in the end, just by looking at what happened with Zen versus KVM, we decided that this would actually be the best way to go forwards. And now this means that orchestration of containers in Linux is done in the same way for every orchestration system. Uh, like I said, there are a lot of C groups. There's blocks, CPU, devices, memory, network, freezer, tons of them. I'm actually not going to talk about them anymore. I'm not going to give a demo about them anymore because my fascination is mostly with namespaces. I already explained there is a network namespace, which is label-based. There is an IPC namespace, which is also label-based. There's a mount namespace, which is technically label-based, but has very interesting properties. I will talk about that a little later. There's the PID namespace that I discussed. There's the UTS namespace, which is to do with virtualizing the host name. The job of this is basically to make NFS run in containers because NFS gets its host name using a system call, and if you're trying to pretend you're on a different host, you need to return a different host name. So the job of the UTS namespace is simply to virtualize that host name. And then there's the nice thing called the user namespace, which was the most recent namespace, but no longer. This one I will also spend a lot of time, a reasonable amount of time in the talk talking about, because it's the most interesting namespace. It's a mapping-based namespace, specifically used to map user and group IDs. And then there's this new thing called the cgroup namespace, which was new in 4.6. Um, if you believe all of these orchestration people, they claim that this interface is almost impossible to use. Docker's big claim to fame is that it was containers made easy for Linux. Uh, I don't think that primarily because I've been using the namespace interface all my life, so I think it's easy. You may have a different opinion, but whatever it was, it wasn't really Docker making the containers interface in Linux easy to use. It was more that Docker and the container interface in Linux materialized at about the same time. So the thing I'm going to t uh, claim to you is that uh, you don't really need to bother with any of these orchestration systems. Uh, you can use... Um, the standard system calls, which is clone set NS, or the user, user space equivalents, which are unsp unshare and NS enter. So those are primarily what I'll use for the demo. But first, a digression about how you make it all work with user namespaces. One of the biggest problems that containers have is how you cope with the root user. In virtualization systems, you don't have a problem because if you have a guest kernel, anybody who can log into that with the root password can get root on that guest and they're fully separated from the host because they have two kernels. In Linux containers, this isn't true because it's only a single kernel. So before the user namespace, if you needed a container that contained root, um, you actually had to put real root into the container, and that meant that if there was any failure of containment or any way that this uh, user broke out of the container, they would become real root in the host and they could do an awful lot of damage. This was one of the principal security arguments against ever using containers natively. Um, fortunately, there are a few people who have been working on native uh, containers for a while. Um, when I joined IBM uh, in 2016, this was one of the reasons I joined, because they're committed to trying to do this. And it's not just from, uh, you know, 
wanting to do it because it's interesting. They want to do it because it's very fast. If you can run containers natively in Linux, the amount of resources you get to share is fantastic. Um, with something like a system container, which is what Parallels did, we always reckon that running system containers natively on Linux gained you about three times over a hypervisor. So what this meant is that for any given physical system, I could run three times the number of guest virtual environments on a native container system than I could on a hypervisor system. And when you're a hoster, this is very valuable because it means that if I get three times the number of customers per physical system, my margins are actually a third of what they are. So it can, in host, the hosting environment where you're buying things like a Linode virtual machine for you know, 10 euros a pop, it can make the difference between profit and loss to a service provider. So this was why Parallels actually made their name in the hosting environments and they weren't actually seen in Linux or anywhere outside it or in particular the enterprise. Um, the interesting thing about the enterprise, the reason it embraced virtualization, is um, the enterprise always had excess hardware. So although virtualization was sold as a way of sort of allowing the enterprise to be nicely administered and uh, allowing a data center to use all of its hardware, in reality in the enterprise that hardware was almost never fully utilized. It wasn't until the cloud came along that we started trying to take virtual environments up to full utilization. Whereas in the hosting space, even way back two decades ago, the platforms were always fully utilized. You were looking to set up a rack and pack as many guests as you could onto that rack, sell as many you know, 10 euro per month uh, virtual machines as you could to get to, to people who wanted their virtual environments in the cloud. So the hosting arena was where the packing was done the most. The enterprise, the packing was very light. So to be honest, all the wasted uh, space and hypervisors never really mattered to the enterprise. The only reason it's starting to matter now is that everybody's on board with this cloud thing, which means lean systems, which means you know your, your enterprise data center should be fully utilized and you should be looking to burst out into the cloud when you uh, run over peak capacity, et cetera, et cetera. And this is why containers are starting to be interesting because with system containers, and that means init running in the container, it looks like a full machine virtual environment, you get about three times um, the, the benefit as you do with virtual machines. With application containers, which is where all you're really doing is running an application in the container system, uh, you can get from hundreds to thousands of units packed onto the same space where one would pack for a virtual machine. Uh, these figures come from Docker. Uh, Docker's unfortunate slight secret, and in fact, one of the unfortunate secrets of all of the container orchestration systems is we're not quite there yet with application containers. I can spin you a wonderful tale about application containers, which means that all I do is I create containment for a set of processes, but they take most of their services from the host outside. But most of the containers that even Docker will bring up are not true application containers because you are very isolated from the actual host environment. In a true application container, you get a lot of sharing between the container itself and the host, which is how come you can pack them so densely. So uh, Docker containers do not pack as densely as a thousand to one versus virtual machines, but I believe it's not unreasonable. Certainly, three would be the far lower bound. You can certainly get three to one on Docker containers. I believe you can get up to 10 to one, and if you're very, very careful with actually how you craft the Docker image, I believe you can get up to 100 to one, although I've never really done it. But anyway, back to making it all work with user namespaces. The problem we have is that a lot of applications require to be run as root. Um, it shouldn't happen in the modern world, but unfortunately it does. If you buy a virtual machine in the cloud, usually you expect to buy root on that virtual machine so you can play with it and you can administer it yourself. So what we have to do is find a way of allowing root to run inside the container without the possibility of it breaking out and damaging the entire subsystem. System. So the solution to this was user namespaces. And user namespaces in a lot of container, the container talks you'll have seen is used as a magic panacea that implies we do something wonderful with security. So the user namespace is supposed to provide all of the security that allows you to run root safely in the container. Uh, what I'm here to tell you is that this is completely untrue. Uh, 
a user namespace is not about securing something or locking something down. What a user namespace actually does is give enhanced privilege to a user. So from a security point of view, it's not actually uh, putting a trigger lock on your gun, it's taking the safety catch off. So a user namespace, because it gives enhanced privileges to a user, has actually been the source of a lot of exploits in the container world that you probably heard about. Um, fortunately, not recently. When I've given talks on containers before, I had to fess up to a lot of uh, exploits we've had. I believe since the 314 kernel, we haven't had any serious, serious security breaches related to the user namespace. But it's not impossible to get them. And the reason is the user namespace does give enhanced privileges to a user. If I enter a user namespace just as an ordinary user, I can suddenly do a lot of things that I couldn't do if I hadn't entered that user namespace. I can do things like create other namespaces. Um, I, I can do things like manipulate networks in fashions that I wouldn't be allowed to do as an ordinary user. So this is why there is a lot of uh, danger to using the user namespace. But one of the things that it can do very well with this enhanced privilege is it can emulate root because root is a more privileged version of an ordinary user. And to get root inside a container, that's precisely what you need. And so this is why the user namespace actually works. It's not really a security thing. It does give you enhanced privilege, but with that enhanced privilege, I can pretend I'm root in the container without actually being real root on the system. So the way user namespace works is it does a mapping between the interior and the exterior IDs. Um, this mapping is in a proc file. If you just cat proc self or oh, just look at proc self on your laptop, you'll see all these mapping files. UID map for the UIDs mapped. GID map for the groups mapped. Project ID map is to do with uh, group quotas. You probably won't have heard of this. It's an XFS thing. EXT4 is just getting into it. By and large, you can ignore that file. And set groups was a file that was invented for yet another exploit we found in the user namespace, which now effectively allows you to use groups as the ability to deny privilege. It's a fairly esoteric technical thing, but it turned out to be an annoyance when uh, we were going through this. On Linux, there's something called shadow utils. Uh, sounds like a science fiction series, which provides a lot of tools that actually help you with the user namespace. Uh, one of the things you have to do if you actually want to use the user namespace with anything other than mapping your UID to root is you actually have to have a set of owned UIDs that you're going to use. This set of owned UIDs is, the, is basically what you can use within your container. Any user ID which is not in that set is inaccessible to you in the container. Effectively, if that user ID enters the container, it becomes nobody. You also, within that container, cannot get access to any range of UIDs outside of the set you're allowed to be mapped to. So this allows the uh, user namespace to actually restrict the set of user IDs that are available inside the container. And it also means that uh, this restriction can actually uh, constrict the guest that's in the container and mean that um, only the UIDs that they actually need to use are present inside the container. And they can all be mapped from UIDs that actually physically don't exist in the host. A user namespace retains the concept of an owning UID. This is effectively root in the user namespace, but what it actually means is this is the kernel ID of the user who created that namespace. Unmapped UIDs are inaccessible, even to root in the namespace. Um, so if I do a diagram of how this works with user space at the top and kernel at the bottom, let's use this one, sorry. Been ignoring the side of the room, I'll come back to you now. Uh, if I had a, a, a wireless mic, I could wander around a bit more, but unfortunately, I'm tied to the table. So you have a UID in user space inside the container, and the kernel has a view of that ID called the kernel ID. So this is how the user namespace maps things. The UID in user space inside the container is mapped to a kernel ID, which is the ID that's invariant, and it's the ID that the kernel sees for you. And then if you're actually trying to write files, there's actually a kernel UID that maps to a file system UID. 
And so if I set up the user namespace, what would happen is um, I would have pretend root in the container, so I think I'm UID zero in the container. It would map to my real kernel UID of a thousand, so that would be my ID to the system. And the problem I actually have when writing to storage is that we always write from the kernel into storage. And this means that all files that I create as pretend root are actually owned really by me. So the UID that the inode gets is also going to be a thousand. This causes one of the biggest cock-up problems for user namespaces because it means that if I am trying to pretend that I'm root in the container and I'm also trying to download pristine images from somewhere like the Docker Hub, most pristine images come with root owners and there's an ID mismatch across this boundary because my real UID zero or my, my pretend UID zero inside the container is mapping to my real kernel ID of a thousand, which maps to my file system ID also of a thousand. And that means that if I look at my root directory just anywhere in bin, those files are all owned by real root in almost every container image you see for Docker. And that would mean that I, could, I wouldn't be able to write to them. And if they were protected against, uh, so say they were read write only by root, I wouldn't even be able to read them. So this is one of the significant problems we're trying to deal with currently with the user namespace. Unless you actually carefully tailor your image to the user namespace, which means I would actually have to have a, an image that was constructed so that root was actually UID 1000 and bin and everything else would go on there. And on my laptop, when I uh, actually do the demos, I have an image which is constructed like that. But the problem is these images aren't shareable because you need to know what ID I'm, I'm actually going to map this image as. So I could have an image that's sort of native Ubuntu mapped to 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000. It's just, it doesn't make sense. What you really want is an Ubuntu image where root is, your, is ID zero. And that means that what I want to be able to do is when I'm writing as pretend UID zero in the kernel through the kernel UID 1,000, when it appears on the inodes, I want to be zero. And this isn't how the user namespace works. Okay, question. Uh, throw Ben the microphone, see if you can avoid hitting him in the head. Thanks. You, you might want to do both. I mean, I can imagine that you might want to prevent a user from creating root files on your system. Um, especially SUID root, for example, type of, of stuff. Um, I can imagine wanting to keep all that pseudo root as a different UID on my shared file system. So uh, the solution to that would have to at least be per mount or per bind mount so that you can have that image that entirely owned by the container that has a real root root on it. But some more shared type of storage where you do have that sort of remapping on the other hand. Yeah, so I didn't say that this was the only way of doing it, and I did say that I had images on my machine that are mapped to unprivileged IDs, and I actually rather like using them like that. But if you're going to use a layered container that's based on overlays like Docker does, you have significant problems. However, you are preempting a discussion that we had at Plumbers Conference in Los Angeles about two weeks ago, where there was interest in the Docker world in actually using um, container images that are mapped to an unprivileged user, but a fixed unprivileged user. And you basically would use some mapping across this boundary, not to map to root, but to map to that fixed unprivileged user. So then you could share images that were unprivileged if you ever escaped containment, but could be shared between multiple users without you having to know what this mapping across the boundary was. So there are other uses for this technology as well, and we will get into some of them. So yes, it's perfectly possible to use it in that way and people are starting to think about it. But anyway, one of the things that came along in the 4.8 kernel was something called a superblock namespace. And this effectively allows you to do a mapping across the storage divide via the superblock. So this mapping can be almost anything. It's actually very difficult to create at the moment. Um, it was created primarily so that you could do things like plug USB sticks into containers and also use Fuse file systems inside containers. 
because obviously if I plug my USB stick in, I do need to map all of the UIDs because otherwise I wouldn't be able to use it from my container. And likewise, things like Fuse. They ha they, Fuse has a definite tie to the real root ID because of some of the properties that it has. And one of the things that you want to use Fuse inside a container to do is to actually uh, protect the Fuse system from having too much privilege because there are lots of unfortunate privilege escalations you get from tricking Fuse to doing things because it's effectively owned by root. So Fuse in a container was actually the primary driving use case for this superblock namespace. But if you look at what this does, um, since effectively we have a user namespace mapping here and we have a user namespace mapping here and those can actually be different mappings, we should have solved everybody's problem because I can now write as UID 0 through KUID 1000 back to UID 0 again and the, my Docker image problem is solved. I could make that an unprivileged user so Ben's problem would be solved or I could actually not even I set up a one-to-one -one mapping and I could just use my standard image files that I currently use today. So in theory, this is completely the answer and this would work for everything. The basic problem is that it's, it is not the answer. And the reason has to do with the fact that you need a super block to do it. And the problem is that most of the way we set up containers is with something called bind mounts. Bind mounts are this wonderful subtree thing in Linux, but they do not possess super blocks. So this means every time I use a bind mount to set up a container, the super block I get is the actual super block belonging to the underlying disk, not a separate super block that the container gets. And that means that that super block is shared by everybody who's using that file system, which for my laptop would be every container I had on the system, which makes it unusable as the solution to this problem. So, how actually do we solve this problem? So, the main issue is that um, struct mount, which is an internal representation of the subtree, effectively. Um, its external representation is struct VFS mount, which is what's visible outside of the file system, contains no super blocks. All it does is it contains a pointer to a super block. And a file system tree is a set of struct mounts. And this, by the way, is the reason why the mount namespace is so special. It's, in theory, a label-based namespace. So when I do an unshare minus mount, I create a completely new subtree within the kernel. But what um, the mount system does is it immediately clones my existing subtree and takes a whole new set of VFS mounts into the mount namespace. And what I end up with looks like an identical file system tree to the one I started with. So if you type unshare minus mount on your laptop and then do a DF, you see absolutely no difference even though you've technically entered a, a completely new mount namespace. In order to give yourself a difference, you actually have to manipulate that mount namespace. Uh, I've already said that. And um, every struct mount in that namespace points to a ref counted superblock. So if I've set up a really complex tree with bind mounts as my root file system, which most laptops now do, thanks to this wonderful thing called systemd, um, and I unshare that, I get another completely replicated set. And the more unshares I do, the more replicated sets I get. But they're all pointing back to this one super block that's the super block of my main root file system and nothing else. The only time I would get a new super block is if I mount something external, but that's precisely what we don't want to do with containers. Containers are supposed to have file roots. We're not supposed to have a block image root for every container. So, this would be something like a tree system D sets up. Let's say that I have my root file system is the red super block, so it begins at the top. And let's say I've mounted a USB stick, so I've got a blue file system. And then system D is handily set up a few bind mounts here. So I have effectively a mount tree that has four struct VFS mounts, three of which point to the red super block, and one of which points to the USB stick, which is the blue super block. So the first thing I'll do is an unshare, which clones that entire tree. So I create a complete set of new things. So instead of three pointers to red and one to blue, I now have six pointers to red and two to blue. And this actually, remember I said that an unprivileged user can create a, a mount namespace. 
So any unprivileged user can now create this mount tree, and this can cause all sorts of interesting things. For instance, supposing I logged in as myself, I created this mount tree, uh, somebody had plugged this USB stick in, and now I have a clone of it. Let's say root on the system wants to unmount that USB stick, so it unmounts that uh, super, uh, unmounts that super block that it sees, and then it tries to eject the stick. The eject will fail because I still have a private reference to the blue super block in the mount tree that I just created. This is an example of why the user namespace can be dangerous, because I've effectively now locked up that system. Unless root can actually pour through all of the mount namespaces and find where I've got this blue one mounted, the choices are either to eject that uh, unceremoniously without, sync without properly syncing it, or to try and chase down my mount namespace, find out where it is, and forcibly unmount it from underneath me. So the, the, these are some of the unintended consequences. Some of the other things you can actually do is uh, fully manipulate that tree. So you can do things like hack bits off. I can actually do a pivot root on this, so I could actually pivot to a fully different um, file system tree if I really wanted to. The only point is that I start with a clone of what existed before. But this gets me no nearer to solving the problem of how do I actually take these bind-mounted images and write at UID zero. There was one solution which was a fuse-based solution called BindFS. It was done by Matthew Patel a long time ago. Um, it remounts a subtree with a UID and GID shift, so this can be made to work. Yeah, I'm doing okay on time. I proposed a solution about ooh, uh, almost a year ago now called ShiftFS, which does the same thing in the kernel. Um, so it, it acts a bit like uh, BindFS did, but it's based, it's subtree based, and it's what what it effectively is is it's a bind mount that has a super block, which seemed to be the easiest way of doing it. And that means it picks up this superblock namespace when mounted, and it means that if the admin marks part of the tree to be shifted, I can use shiftfs to actually do this mapping back to UID zero. And that means that the container can then remount it and then get access to all of the things that I want to do as root. So let's see if I can actually do a demo of this. So let's see. I talk. Is that about big enough for everybody? So first thing I told you is user namespaces are dangerous. So here's me. Um, oh, let's favor this side of the room now, because I'm leaning on this, this thing. I'm user ID 1000, group ID 100, my usual. I've actually got a subsidiary group for Docker. If I simply create, a, well, let's, let me just demonstrate one of the permission problems. So I would try and create a mount namespace. And I'm not allowed to do it as a real user. But if I create a user namespace, um, the minus R option says install a mapping in UID maps and GID maps that maps my UID and GID to the root UID and GID. So you think I'm root. If I ask the system what I am, the system thinks I'm root as well. Um, and now what I can actually do is create a new mount namespace. So something I couldn't do if I hadn't entered the user namespace, I can now do. This is an example of the user namespace actually elevating my privilege. If I look at what process I am, I'm process ID 878978. So I think I'm root. However, 
if I look from outside the container, if you can see that, I'm actually still myself. So all this has done is done an effective mapping between me inside the container and me outside the container. But with this effective mapping, I can actually do an awful lot of things. So I have created a mount namespace here. Um, let me make that a bit bigger. Yep. So to demonstrate how this bindFS thing works, uh, let me first of all, oh, let me first of all show you what, if I look in the bin directory here, because remember, although I created a mount, mount namespace, I've just got a clone of the file system tree. So I've got everything that used to be on this file system tree. What I actually see is nobody and no group for all the ownerships of everything in here. This is because if you look at my ID mapping, all I've done is I've mapped from root to my own UID and there's just a range of one in that mapping. So the only UID that's available to me inside this namespace is myself as root. No other UID is available. So any file owned by bin, uh, anything would actually show up as nobody in no group because I, I actually have access to nothing. For security reasons, unless you have control of a set of mappings through the shadow utility, the only thing you can do with the minus R option is to map your own UID to root. But it's enough for me to do this demo. So what I've done is I've created a bin directory that's sort of basically a copy of that bin directory in my temporary file system. Um, as root, I can actually mark this file system for mounting by unprivileged users. So I'm going to take the copy of bin that I took and I'm going to mount it in this mark that I've set up. Oh, uh, sorry. That better? Yeah, let me, sorry. It's, my laptop screen is a lot bigger than this one. So, but anyway, that should do. I'm gonna mark it on this mount point here. So all that does as root, because I use sudo to do this, is it installs a mark giving permission for anybody to mount this temp mount point mount inside a namespace. And for security reasons, if you actually look in here, I've got all these executables, but they are actually not executable in this directory. It's uh, effectively mounted with no exec. But what that means is inside my container, I can go to the same point and, oh, uh, sorry, let me come out. Obviously, because of what I've done, I've modified the root mount tree. I will not see it inside my container unless I re-enter it. So now I'll re-enter it so I get a clone of the mount tree with the mark. I'll create a mount namespace. So now I actually should have, yep. So now what I can do is as my fake root, which is me inside the container, So that's the marked mount point, and now I'm going to mount it on a mount point which is available to me, which is actually owned by me. And that succeeds, and if I go into this shift point, now what I see is everything owned by root in this directory. Not only is everything owned by root, but I can also execute things, and I can even create files. I think there's no test in here. So if I create test, I've created a zero length file, but if I go back into the real copy of it, which was bin, you can see that I've created this test file and it's now really owned by root. So this is me really manipulating container images. And I suppose just as a brief demo, I'll do this one for Ben's benefit. 
Um, what I actually have, this was the question he was asking, I have a lot of, um, these are emu uh, my container emulation systems. If you look, they're all owned by UID 100,000 because my mapping for these images is 100,000 is base root and then every other ID builds up on top of that. So if I actually enter these containers, let's do the PowerPC one. What I've actually done is enter the PowerPC container as root. I'm now actually sitting inside this mount point. I've done a root pivot, and I'm actually using an emulation system to really, really be a PowerPC system. So if you look in my, sorry. Oh, for God's <laughs> sake. LS is there, right? So if you look at what I'm executing, I'm actually executing 64-bit PowerPC binaries. So I've done a full pivot route and everything. I'm actually using QMU in the host to actually do this emulation. But this means that I can actually set up a full build system for PowerPC on my laptop just using an architecture emulation container. And because I'm actually coming through um, a user namespace, um, remember, I entered this fully unprivileged. I had to do nothing that was privileged to enter this namespace. Um, I can actually become myself again. Uh, in theory, I can become myself. Okay, I don't know what's wrong with that. Um, and I could go to my own home directory and I can manipulate a whole load of stuff. And again, if you look at my the process I think I am. Yeah, got it. So I think I'm root, but outside the container, I will now be 100,000. So I've, I've, sh I've switched to a fully unprivileged user who's a sort of outside the control of pretty much anything. Anyway, let's come out of the demo. And go back to this. So uh, as a little uh, side effect of that, there is now interest in uh, making QMU user space not be trot anymore. Because that thing has been is in pretty terrible state. At last I, I, I did fix a pile of bugs in the PPC one about a, two years ago. Yes, I know. So the PowerPC one didn't used to be my demo. AH64 used to be my demo because the PowerPC one didn't work, but now it does. So thanks, yeah. Ben. Um, I am really not doing anything with. QMU uh, getting it to work, I'm just using it. The reason I actually set up this architecture emulation container was primarily for ARCH64 because I do a lot of work in secure boot and TPMs as well and I produce some utilities which are now in use on ARCH64 UEFI systems and I have no ARCH64 machines at all. So I had to find a way of making sure that this, uh, I had to find a way not only of building this stuff but actually also of testing this stuff. So I actually use these ar architecture emulation containers also for testing. It turns out that um, there was a trouble a long time ago with getting this ARCH64 hardware, so they invested a lot in getting QMU up to scratch, which is what I believe the PowerPC guys are now doing. But this will actually be useful, I think, in the long run, because it means that I can run a PowerPC64 container and dev test on my laptop, or I can do the same thing with an ARCH64 container. It means that I don't actually have to physically possess the machine to build the containers to play with it. And one of the things, if you believe in a non-x86 world, that we'd really like to do is that with sort of the new cloud container paradigm, everybody wants to dev test on their laptop and then ship to the cloud. If we can't do that with cross architectures, it's not really going to work. So I would suggest that it's probably in your interest rather than mine to make sure that the QMU user space doesn't bit right. It's not specific to RPC itself as well. I mean, the QMU user space is still missing a part of new syscalls. There, there, I mean, there's a bunch of corner cases. Your SU not working was probably 
something related to that as well before? No, it used to work. I, I'm having a, so part of the problem with this laptop is I actually tried to install the RC2 kernel on the plane and it failed miserably, but it is running RC1. To, uh, 414 RC1. I suspect there's something wrong with that one as well, so I, I can debug it later. Yeah, right. But like I said, I came straight from the plane here, so I didn't have much time to look at mm -hmm. it. I already suspect that the reason RC2 doesn't run is something to do with network, but I still haven't figured out what. It seems to be a denial of an access failure in local sockets. I, I really don't know what's going on. So I, I don't think it will be the fault of the emulation environment. Okay, so, um, well, I've still got 10 minutes, so I'll take you to lunch. Um, one of the things that uh, I demonstrated here was this thing called ShiftFS, but ShiftFS is not yet upstream. And the reason it's not upstream is because we've had a lot of controversy over it. So this LSFMM is the annual gathering of storage file system memory management people. It took place in Boston in March, so we're about six months away from it now. Um, and I had the privilege of standing up in front of Al Vero, which is um, describing what I'm doing. So Al is, I don't know if, if any of you have met him, he's Ukrainian, he uh, smokes a lot, and he's prone to use blasphemy in all sorts of weird ways that uh, tends to be somewhat shocking to someone of uh, tender appearance like me. Um, so. Uh, he didn't actually say that faking a bind mount simply to get a super block feels icky. What he said would unfortunately violate all of the code of conduct in Mozilla and actually get me thrown out of the building, but it was sufficiently bad for me to suspect that this thing will never go upstream in its current form. <laughs> Al said what, sir? Yes, yeah, so the point is that Al is not necessarily God in terms of this, but he is file system maintainer. So the question they asked me is, can we just make this uh, S user namespace work without having to do any of this bind man stuff? And the answer to that is pretty much none less we really modify the way S user namespace works. It cannot be a property of the super block if we want it to work for bind mounts. Um, there was an other proposal by uh, Jalal Haruni that was to use uh, effectively an inode view. Um, so in, f in many ways it bypassed the superblock namespace and it went straight to uh, mappings on disk and you set these up in all sorts of weird wonderful ways. It can be made to work, it's just that it also looks to be a bit icky in Al's words. I have actually got a prototype of this using security X attributes to make it all work. So I know it can function, um, but it can't be made to work with the super block user namespace, which was one of the things that we were all asked to do at um, the LSFMM. So what am I thinking now? Um, this is what Linux actually currently looks like. So um, in the VFS, you have super blocks you have dentries which are effectively names of files, and you have inodes which are effectively on-disk representations of files. Uh, the way it works is that every dentry must point to a superblock so you know which file system it's on, and it must point to an inode so you know which file it is. And obviously, uh, every inode also must point to a superblock because it needs to know what disk it's on as well. And the S user namespace sits in here, and as I've explained, this means that it's effectively unshareable for all bind mounts because there's this VFS mount structure that sits above all of these that has pointers to dentries and pointers to super blocks. What you'd really like to do is to actually move this S user namespace from the super block to the VFS mount. That would actually allow you to use S user namespace in the way I've just described for a bind mount because now VFS mount is actually the structure that represents all bind mounts. So this looks to be a wonderfully simple solution and in fact this is what they recommended uh, us to do. The problem with this solution is effectively it requires a full rewrite of the VFS API. And I don't mean slight, I mean almost every VFS call has to be rewritten. The problem is that if you look at most VFS interfaces, they're formulated in terms of the dentry. The dentry doesn't know what the VFS mount is. There is this thing called a path which knows, where the, which knows the VFS mount 
and the DEN tree, but most of the VFS APIs do not use struct path, they use struct DEN tree. So before this can be made to work, somebody has to basically rotor root the entire VFS API to make it take struct path everywhere it says struct DEN tree. And not surprisingly, Everybody in LSFMM thought that doing this would be wonderful because it gets you a whole load of other useful things for bind mounts as well. Um, absolutely nobody volunteered to do it. I can't think why. <laughs> but I think this is the way that Al wants the problem to be solved. It's just that everybody's sitting there going, well, as long as somebody else does it, I don't mind. I think this looks wonderful. Um, and like I said, it does allow other VFS mount properties. So Ted Cho is burbling over the fact that if we had properties as part of VFS mount and we modified the VFS to do this, he could do things like having a bind mount that, was, that trans translated from a case insensitive file system to a case sensitive file system. You've no idea how useful this actually is for emulating Windows on Linux. So it would allow us to do all sorts of other interesting things. And obviously the final alternative is just to abandon S user namespace, which nobody really wanted to do. So, in conclusion, I'm taking you up to lunch. Um, we still have absolutely no agreed solution. The solution that everybody agreed to, nobody wants to implement. The solution that works, uh, most people in the VFS think is icky and we don't want to put upstream, so we're a bit stuck here. Um, hopefully we will have something soon. I'm basically going to sit in my hands and hope that somebody else rewrites the VFS because I'm certainly not signing up to do it, not being a file system maintainer. Um, but we do have several ways in which we could solve this issue. And we do actually have pressure building from the containers world to get a damn solution to this because it seems to be holding up a lot of uh, things like running unprivileged Docker containers, running fully unprivileged containers, solving a lot of container security issues. So with that, I'll just say uh, thank you. If you've enjoyed this presentation, it's done with ImpressJS. It's written in CSS5 and Java, which makes me a web developer, but don't tell my kernel colleagues. Otherwise, they won't invite me to the parties. And with that, I'll say thank you and call for questions. So you've got six minutes until lunch. Any question you haven't asked? Yes, Ben. Oh. Ben is handing you the microphone. He's not even going to throw it out. Uh, so with, with, uh, when using ShiftFS, what happens? What, happen <laughs> what happens uh, if you uh, create a suid root file in the container? How does that look on the outside? So uh, if you create an suid root file in the container, it becomes an suid root file on the outside. You can prevent that by mounting with the no SUID option, but the problem is that container images require SUID root to function. That was actually probably why sudo wasn't working for me. I was probably not getting, uh, but anyway. So this is a, an extreme danger if you can actually get access along, this, along a path to the uh, shifted and the unshifted version of your file system, which means that administrators, if they set this up, would have to be incredibly careful. The way you should set it up is there should be no available path through the VFS that you can, yeah. the, the, the user themselves, without entering the namespace, can get to the mount point. If you looked at my marked mount point, it was not executable, which means that if you created an SUID root binary, you still can't execute it. So you can get, it, as long as you can see the marked mount point, but not the real mount point, we're sort of safe from this. But there are many ways to navigate through the VFS and to, if a file system tree is connected, chances are somebody can find a way of breaking, breaking into that file system tree, and chances are they could execute that SUID binary. So it is a danger, yes. Okay, you're not going to be playing basketball anytime soon. Uh, would another approach uh, consist in um, extending the file systems to store uh, secondary UIDs, uh, UID for each file, just like we have multiple UIDs for processes, for example, like uh, effective, real, whatever. Uh, we could imagine having a native UID for a file and an exposed UID, for example, which would be used uh, inside containers only. Because if we think about it, uh, I suspect that uh, most files are either classified as system files or user, uh, user files. Uh, 
and most user files uh, could be mapped uh, with uh, their, uh, the um, exposed UID equal to the uh, native UID, and system files uh, could be mapped uh, with the user uh, UID and uh, the, the root, for example, for the exposed UID, and files which would be created inside the container would automatically get the <coughs> user uh, UID as a na native one, and the container's UID, in, I mean the user inside the container UID as a secondary one, for example. So the answer to that is yes, it is perfectly possible. The problem with what you propose is that no file system currently has the secondary UID. So instead of rewriting the entire VFS, which is what they proposed me to do, you would propose rewriting every file system so we had the secondary not exactly, UID. Not exactly, because we have extended attributes, for example, or stuff like this. Maybe it would be possible to store such information there. So. Uh, if you looked at the slides, I did say I had prototyped the, uh, the inode UID, which is effectively what you're talking about, as extended attributes. Um, patience in the file system layer is wearing thin for just basically shoving everything into extended attributes. They are starting to yell a bit about this because we have ex security extended attributes, we have IMA extended attributes, we've got extended attributes that are spraying all over the place for all of this. So it, it is perfectly possible to use an extended attribute for this. Um, the main problem we have with extended attributes is we're starting to run into difficulties with what we do with them when we start to virtualize things. So if you look at things like the security extended attributes, there's been a massive row about virtualizing them now, which we need to solve before we can actually use extended attributes properly within containers. The more extended attributes we add, the greater this row becomes and the more difficulty we have. But Anyway, it could be a uh, thought about for future file systems as well. I mean, if we uh, imagine that a model with two <coughs> UIDs per file would work, uh, it could probably encourage uh, taking this into account for future file systems, maybe. But it might not just be two IDs per file. Supposing this, this Docker view where they want multiple different mappings to the same image, that would require multiple per file. So we're already getting into the realms of things which are quite difficult. And it's going to be not only a where do we put it problem, because it, it grows with that sort of even extended attributes have limits to the amount of stuff you can put into them. But it's also going to be a will it scale problem as well if we start doing things like that. So I, I, it is possible. I have prototyped something like it, but I really don't think it's the answer, just because okay. of the scaling and other problems. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Oh, well, you all want to go to lunch, I think. Thank you very much.